Dr. Mark Gilbert is an epidemiologist who leads the Apply Epidemiology Unit at the Ontario HIV Treatment Network and leads the Online Sexual Health Services Program at the BC Centre for Disease Control. His areas of interest include understanding the determinants of HIV epidemics, gay men's health, and evaluation and online intervention. Here we go, Mark Gilbert. Thanks, Olivier. Um, so, uh, on behalf of Olivier, Joshin, Daniel, and myself, I'm happy to sort of share with you some of the preliminary findings from some work that we actually funded through the grant and sort of some preparatory work to help us to understand a bit about what information are we providing to gay men and how are we doing it. And I'd also like to thank uh, Laurie Donnell for um, nicely sort of going over these preliminary findings with me and sort of giving me a bit of a health literacy kind of spin on what the findings mean. So just to go back to the framework um, that you know, sort of introduced yesterday around sort of the user provider system kind of triangle, um, in my presentation I want us to focus on that provider piece. Um, and as you recall we talked about how providers can be individual providers who are one on one kind of providing information but also at an agency level and so this environmental scan is really focused at the agency level in terms of providers of information. And so why is it important for us to focus on agency providers? And I think it's probably pretty self-evident to most people in the room, but um, certainly providing education about raising awareness of risk, prevention and testing is a consistent recommendation and a pretty fairly major area of effort for many of us, many agencies. Um, evaluations of social marketing campaigns do show effectiveness um, of social marketing campaigns in reaching gay men. Um, and gay men describe websites and campaigns as being one of many sources of information about new technologies, as we've sort of seen a couple of times. And this is the results just from a, a survey of HIV negative men that was done a couple of years ago uh, here in Vancouver um, as part of the evaluation of the Hottest at the Start campaign about the early uh, HIV test or QHIV testing, where most people had uh, heard of the technology and 40% said that it was because of seeing the health initiative for men campaign or website. So, so clearly it's not the only source of information but there is a role for this as an information provider. So the, and uh, so if you think about what the potential impact of this is, um, we argued that a critical and systematic examination needs to be conducted, um, both in terms of thinking how the information is presented, but also what assumptions are being made either explicitly or implicitly by how the information is presented. Um, and with our thinking that by taking stock of the current landscape that we could look at how the health literacy of agency providers could be improved and identify gaps for future research. So therefore, the objective of our study was to understand the current state of information provided about HIV risk and prevention on Canadian websites targeted in whole or in part to gay, bisexual or other men of sex with men. And our questions became, uh, as one might expect, the how do the agencies display the information and what are the assumptions about the levels of health literacy and numeracy. So to do this, uh, we looked for websites or online campaigns that were developed since 2011 um, with information that was relevant for men of sex with men. We were looking at websites from community-based or government agencies um, that appeared to have the public um, or a lay audience as their intended audience. So we, um, we didn't include personal blogs, news or research sites um, and we didn't include sites that were from agencies but seemed to have a focus more on, on other providers like healthcare providers or healthcare workers. So yeah, we were carefully sort of defining what slice of the pie that we were looking at and this was sort of our approach into looking at this knowing that it's not um, fully the part of all of the agencies and the kind of information that people provide. So we first started with a Google search and we restricted it to Canada and we used a fairly broad search strategy. Um, all of the, we looked at a hundred search results in English and French and reviewed each of those to find agencies and we did that twice so two of us um, reviewed those, each of those searches. If often the, the, the Google search turned up a PDF document on a website, we went to that document and looked at the agency that provided that document and that was the agency that we went to, the website of the agency we went to. Um, we then uh, identified a subset of those that were the eligible websites, shared that with um, uh, experts, um, who many of whom are here today and people who are part of the project, um, to then added, suggested other websites or other campaigns that weren't on the list and again we reviewed each of those to see if they were eligible and then sometimes we found a couple of websites because they had been linked to or referred to on another website, so sort of a bit by a snowball method. Um, with the input of the broader team, we developed a coding form and we, we wanted to describe the website and the audience. We wanted to look at risk prevention and testing topics and how the information was presented. Issues as well of sort of that uh, functional aspects of the websites, how accessible was the information, was the information readable, were the websites navigable and easy to use. Um, and here we've so far just done a single review and a second review as planned. <laughs> 
Um, we're also planning to do, um, we've got a, we've had gone through a similar process for sites from the United Kingdom, working with our colleagues from Scotland, and we're going to be doing that as well and to sort of broaden uh, this in a future stage. So in order, we've actually found it was quite, uh, we had to, uh, two of us had to review each website to determine what was the most relevant content to include, so we did that. Um, and if we had multiple sites from one agency, so if there was an agency that produced a number of different social marketing campaigns, we treated them all together as a group because we really wanted sort of like one coding form per agency. Um, and then uh, sort of entered and analyzed the data. So to tell you about the results, um, so in total, our, our Google search um, came up with 16 um, eligible agencies. Um, the expert input identified another 30, and we found three by Snowball. So we had 49 sites in total that we looked at. Just to uh, describe the sample, um, about a quarter of the sites appeared to be a social marketing campaign. 78% um, were community-based organizations, with most of the remaining being government organizations. About a quarter had a very had a specific focus on gay, bisexual, other men who have sex with men, so not including other populations. 19% um, uh, included French language, uh, and um, most had a specific focus on HIV, although the next most common was sort of sexual health in general, including HIV. So just to touch base on the topics that were presented, so this uh, shows the top 10 uh, risk topics and the top 10 prevention topics. And to do this, um, we came up with a list of 20 potential risk topics that we thought uh, could potentially be included um, and 24 potential prevention topics that could be included. On average, about eight um, uh, risk topics per site and about six prevention topics per site. Um, so I won't go through this list in detail, but you can see certainly when it comes to HIV risk, the top topics are related to how HIV is transmitted. Um, and we look at the top 10 topics for prevention, condoms and lubricant are sort of at the top of the list. But what you may be notice, noticing is that there are some topics that are missing. And certainly when we look at information which is possibly more newer information or more recent information, um, uh, we can see that uh, these tended to be lower. So for example, in terms of risk topics, 22% of sites had information relevant to zero sorting about sort of a partner's HIV status in your own. Um, we had 16% um, had information about viral load and the impact on transmission, and 12% having information about acute HIV. For prevention topics, 13% uh, talked about treatment as prevention, and 9% talked about PrEP. And when we looked at specifically those 26% of websites that had a specific focus on gay and bisexual men, we did see that these topics were a little bit more common on those sites, but not by much, with the exception of acute HIV, which seemed to be much more common in sites um, involving or focused on, on gay men. So that was sort of the, the topics themselves uh, and the content. And then we wanted to look at how the information is provided. And this picks up on certainly some of the things that James was talking about in the earlier presentation. Um, so 45% of, so first we looked to see whether the risks or strategies were explicitly compared to each other. So there was a way to actually look and compare sort of across the different um, techniques. Um, for risk that was much more common, 45% had some form of presenting risks sort of side by side, not that many when it came to prevention topics. We were then interested interested in how the information uh, was presented in terms of both the magnitude of the risk, so how big a risk, um, uh, a risk factor was, or looking at the strategy, the prevention strategy in terms of the impact, in terms of what, how much of an impact a strategy had. Um, for uh, about often these, and these are not mutually exclusive because different, they could be presented in different ways within the same website. Um, you know, and 71% of the time a risk or was talked, wasn't actually really talked about in terms of any sense of the size. It was just presented as a risk strategy. And to a lesser extent, this happened on some prevention sites as well. Most, most of the ways that the information was presented was using prose or using text. Um, and very few sites um, used kind of numeric information, including sort of probabilities and ratios or risks or numerical estimates of risks or risk reduction. Um, and interestingly, and I'll show an example of this, a number of sites use um, sort of an equation model for preventing information about risk, which is sort of a combination of sort of pros and numeracy, um, and which was kind of an interesting thing to see as we went through this. Um, and then uh, just, uh, again, uh, James sort of introduced some of these concepts this morning, but when in the sites, most of them did use that sort of pros or text. And uh, at least when it came to uh, risk, it was sort of even between sort of absolute measures and relative measures, um, but when it came to prevention, and these were most likely presented um, as sort of relative, like saying, like X increases your or lowers your risk um, of HIV. Um, getting uh, sort of a little bit more detail, um, most, much of the time the information is presented using text um, with lesser amounts of time using things like tables or images. Um, and only uh, two sites had some degree of sort of an interactive element uh, to the website. 
So just some examples. So here's sort of three different websites that approached um, uh, different ways of using text or prose to talk about risk or prevention strategies using a variety of different kind of language and formats even within uh, the context of, of prose or text. Um, and as uh, James had mentioned, um, the Canadian Aid Society kind of approach of using a table where you're talking about high versus low risk and medium risk was, a, was a, probably the next most common way that risks were presented. And there's a couple of examples here using a variety of different kinds of terminology um, as well as different, uh, different styles of language. Um, we saw then, uh, you know, fewer sites using sort of graphical ways of presenting information, but certainly some examples here of that being done. And then finally, one of the, you know, the interactive sites, and James had mentioned this earlier, was the HIV risk calculator um, uh, on the Health Initiative for Men website, which is a, a calculator that allows you to sort of answer a series of questions and calculate your own level of risk. This is an example of that equation that I mentioned. Um, so, uh, for example, it sort of talks about HIV transmission being related to the presence of different factors, in this case having an HIV positive body fluid, direct access to the bloodstream, and a risk activity le leading to possible HIV transmission. Um, and some variants of this uh, were found on a number of different sites. And then moving to sort of how easy it was to find the information. So. Um, between 22 and 24 percent of the time, the information was located in a PDF document, um, which, uh, if you're sort of going to a website, means that it's not necessarily that accessible to find. Um, 43 percent of the time, risk information, and 39 percent of the time, prevention information was found either through the Google search directly to the topic, um, or it was on the home page, or it was with one click. Um, but overall, the impression of us as we were reviewing the sites um, was that the information was easy to find about between 74 and 83 percent of the time. Some other aspects related to sort of the accessibility of the information and engagement of the site. Um, um, most often sites use plain language, so 65% of the time that's using terminology like sex or infection or penis. Um, colloquial language was less common, 16% of the time that's using language like fucking, topping, bottoming, for example. Um, but 35% of the time still using fairly technical language or jargony kind of language like saying, you know, insertive anal intercourse, for example, being an example of that. Um, in terms of more uh, engaging features on websites, uh, these weren't that common. The most common were animation, um, videos, as well as then service or clinic finders. And 35% uh, of sites actually had an ask a question kind of feature um, that was a component of the website. Um, the reading level was generally fairly high, so this is a grade level of 10, um, a median grade level of 10 with the interquartile range being between 8 and 12, and, and certainly um, in speaking with Laurie, sort of a recommendation being that it should be much lower on average, um, sort of around a grade 6 reading level. We also used a sort of a validated instrument called the LIDO instrument, which is a way of, of measuring the usability of a website. Um, and it has a number of different subdomains that go into that. Um, and I think the important ones to note here are, um, so the total, for example, of all the sites was a median of 41 out of a possible score of 54. Um, but in looking at the functionality domain, for example, we see a median of 11 out of a total of 18, so that was a bit lower. Functionality being sort of having effective search or browsing, um, and as well as sort of trying to assess the cognitive overheads, kind of like how, mu how much tasks you have to keep in your head as you're browsing through the site to understand where you are within the site. Um, but much poorer when it comes to engageability, and that includes things like, um, you know, can you make a, a judgment of whether the site applies to you? Um, is it interactive? Can you personalize your experience? Is it using sort of non-text media? And that sort of goes along with the opposite table where we sort of try to describe the features of the website. So uh, just in terms of discussion then, I think um, generally we found less provision of information about what might be considered more emerging topics such as acute infection or viral load. Um, we found certainly uh, some challenges in finding the information, although overall we felt that that was fairly easy to find. Um, a clear reliance on text and prose over other non-text ways of presenting information, um, with still a third of site use using fairly technical language um, and of concern having really high grade levels in terms of what you needed um, in order to read and understand the content. Um, I think the, the other piece is that the poor engagement is sort of, um, sort of a really kind of web 1.0 kind of approach, which is sort of thinking about consumers of information um, and not being sort of active participants in the information or the generation of the information. Um, and, you know, leads me to wonder about, um, you know, that there probably is some room for improvement um, and wondering whether there are sort of best practices around this or if that's an area um, potentially for intervention.
there were some questions that arose for us as we went through this um, in terms of, for example, you know, well, what influences, what topics are provided and what aren't? Is this purely a matter of time lag with newer information to sort of taking time to come onto the website? Is it a matter of resources and challenges with updating information or creating sort of more up-to-date or engaging websites? Um, or there are other factors in terms of like uncertainty around information that makes it less likely for information to be on websites, for example. Um, we also were struck in a couple of cases about some language that struck us as being either inappropriate um, um, in one way or another or language that was inappropriate, for example, seeing vampirism in a list of risks um, to, to consider with HV transmission, which is uh, valid for some percentage of the population but kind of detracts potentially from the rest of the message that you have in that. Um, uh, Olivia was struck by the example of the, the term on, some web, on a French website of jeu scatologique, which is French for scat play, um, which apparently is not not a term that he has seen commonly used. Um, and, and also we were struck, there were a couple of times where we, we saw some really flippant kind of comments um, about HIV um, that really sort of struck us as being um, quite concerning to see it on the website. So those were areas that I think we sort of discussed uh, amongst ourselves as things that might be worth looking at a little bit more. Um, and. Uh, Oh yeah, I had a point with this one, and I don't remember. I, I'm bringing it back, I think, to this. Um, oh yeah, I think what I wanted to say here was that, um, again, just going back to the, you know, we have just been focusing on this aspect of the providers, um, and really, we don't, we need to understand how this sort of circle up here with the providers really does interact on the other levels with the users in the system. Um, we know that it's sort of one fraction of the, um, uh, of the information landscape. We don't know anything about, well, we at least we don't know anything about how gay men sort of go to these websites, do they go to these websites, do they access this information, or how do they find out about this information. And so those are definitely gaps of things that we think uh, we need to know. So certainly just in closing, I want to acknowledge um, uh, these are many of the people who either sort of acted as sort of experts or provided input in terms of the methodology and the study design, and we were very grateful for that. Um, and also, as I mentioned, this was funded through the grant um, that sort of is responsible for the workshop related to the summit. So thank you very much.